Chris BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. I can't sleep. I don't know if it's day or night. Night or day, I don't know. Took a three-hour nap yesterday afternoon and a two-hour nap in the middle of the tonight, and I've tried to sleep three different times, and I can't sleep. And it's Big Rig Radio's fault. I'll go into that in a minute. Gentlemen, what we're, what we're here to talk about today is the magic of this. What I'm demonstrating to you is my Dow key. My high-speed Dow key. Now, the way my Dow key works is way different than what most other people's Dow keys work. Okay? Once you have a waterfall display like this, you can't go back. You just can't go back to just having the little needle moving back and forth. You just, you gotta, you gotta see what's going on on the whole band. So my friend, Mr. Steve, aka Superstar, my very good personal friend, um, who I've actually grown to really become close friends with, um, he went out and he made the major purchase of buying an ICOM 7300. Okay. The problem with the ICOM 7300 is when you take it onto AM, the audio is horrible. And you, you, there's these guys out there. They say that they can create all this masterful crap. And it, it, I don't buy into any of it. There's guys that have got uh, modulator units. And they've got all these different hi-fi mods you can do to the radio, and it's supposed to make it sound phenomenal on AM. They don't work. <laughs> they just don't work. So what you end up having. In the in the in the very beginning, the ICOM was like a thirteen, seventeen, thirteen hundred dollar radio, right? Now it's a seven hundred dollar receiver. They've devaluated since the seventy eight tens come out. Well, you can use what I'm going to show you here, um, so that you can have a nice high end receiver with good fidelity and good sound to it. Like I use a seventy six hundred. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, I use a seventy three hundred to receive myself as in like to re hear my own transmissions um, but I use just a standard Cobra 29 when I go to talk or as I jokingly say on the radio I use a Krako handheld because that's basically what all that box is is just a rubber band with a box you know it's a box with a rubber band in it and a battery um, all my audio is pre and post processed digitally then returned to an analog state and direct injected into the radio so all the radio does is give me just a little bit of weep signal for me to go and rectify from that point forward. So I don't use any of the fancy-ass transmit shit that's in this ICOM. Nor would you ever want to on AM because they sound horrible on AM. I don't know why ICOM, Kenwood, Alinko, everybody except for a non, they seem like they get, they're getting it. The Apache systems are getting it over there. The radio actually sounds really good on AM for a computerized radio. Um, how to go having a workaround. So when you go into transmit, which that's what I'm doing, I'm fire, firing down on the high o mic holder, or mic gun right now. When you go into transmit, you don't obliterate your receive. So let's slide over to the other bench and let me start explaining this to you guys. Okay. So you and I, were going to go on a little journey. Okay. Uh, this is eventually going to lead to fabrication, by the way, you guys. This is really neat how this works, but I want to walk every single one of you through um, the thought process that allowed me to arri arrive where I'm at today. And I guarantee you, at least a couple hundred people are going to take this and they're going to run with it. And they're going to be like, oh my God, it's brilliant. Okay. So way back when... When they came out with the uh, 756 Pro 2, I purchased one. And that was my very first taste of having a waterfall pan adapter display. And I loved it. 
and my little nippies got hard and I have never looked back ever since. The problem is all of those radios have horrible transmit. So like I discussed in the lead in on this video, we're going to talk about a workaround for that. Now the Dow key system has been around for a million years. Let me get the oldest one that I have in the house right now. It's for my Collins that I have. <laughs> and this is it. I have not invented anything new, but I took it to a different page. There's a little bit of weep current that's sent to this thing that runs this relay. And how a Dow key works is you have a transmitter and you have a receiver. They both do completely separate devices. You know, they both can, <laughs> but they both have to have access to the same piece of coax here. So look, one coax, two coaxes, okay? All this does is it takes the access to the antenna and says, you're gonna to go to this coax or you're gonna to go to this coax. And depending on what you're doing with it, if you're in transmit or if you're in receive, when the relay's in the relaxed position where the, the coil's not charged, you're gonna have it in the receive position. So as soon as you grab the microphone and fire down, it's gonna go click and click it over. Okay, so that's great if you have two devices that are inherently mute. What I mean by that is the receiver just receives and the transmit just transmits. If you have two radios, which are transceivers, that means they have the ability to transmit and receive internally, you're gonna have one radio <laughs> that's gonna be in receive when the other unit's in transmit. Think about it for a second. So you have these incredibly sensitive radios these days, not built with tubes and not rugged tanks like the old Collins. They're very delicate. I know this because I had an ICOM 756 Pro 2 that within a month of me having it, I couldn't hear an air raid siren as a transmitter going off next to that radio. It was deaf as a post. Blew all the diodes right out of the front end of that thing, completely desensitized it. And that was with a 5 watt radio. So today, most of your amateur rigs that have pan adapter waterfalls are 100 watt radios. Okay? They might not sound the best, but they've got great awesome receives. So we wanted to capitalize on that. Well, if you go out there and you're going to go, oh, this is no big deal. Mother F and junk makes great stuff. No, they don't. This is, you guys have all seen my video on this, this giant steaming pile of turd bucketness that is produced by MFJ. This is a very cheap pile of garbage that uh, doesn't even give you 20 dBs worth of attenuation. Um, I should open this. Let me open this real quick. I tried like hell to work this out to where we could get this it wouldn't fry our radios this is their SDR version this is the one that's supposed to knock the signal down so far that you can run like a software to find radio in tantalum or in pair or in partner or in crimed with the you know your full-blown hundred watt transmitter well you guys seen my review on this thing this thing's a steaming pile of crap so I thought, well, I'm going to try and take it another step. So I went into the inside of mine and heavily modified it. I made it a completely copper line box because I didn't want to go through the pain in the process of trying to find the exact aluminum case this would go to because MFJ is too cheap. Went and neutralized, put everything with 316 coax in it to try and, because it just got bare wire in there, you guys. And the RF leak inside this thing was horrible. Anyhow, I was able to get it down an, an additional from the 10 dBs attenuation, that 10 dBs, that's it. You think about that signal attenuation, you're gonna put 100 watts by this thing. That SDR is just a receiver, it's fully receiving all the time, it's live. You're gonna overload the receiver and, well, destroy it. 
I was able to get an additional th uh, 20 on top of that, so I was able to, to go down 30 dB. Um, there's some other things that we could have done on this thing. We could have isolated out certain sections of this board, and we could have added some resistors to ground that would have come in with an additional relay, and we probably could have got it down to where it was something somewhat acceptable, but screw that. So anyhow, that was the SDR experiment. That came way later. But I was explaining to my friend Steve that the way that I make this work for me is I capitalize on the fact that all my HF radios aren't Mars modded. Drop the mic. <clears throat> my 756 Pro II was Mars modded. And so I tried all kinds of different stuff. And what I finally figured out is that the radio goes into infinite attenuation and it totally isolates out the receiver side. If it isn't Mars modded, you just put the radio into transmit. So what we're going to build is a two-stage Dow key. Okay. So we're going to say ANT. This is your antenna. And then over here, you're going to have radio, radio. Now, like I was explaining, we'll say this, I think he's going to use like a, a 955 or something. Okay. And then he's going to have a 7300. Okay. Like I was explaining before, we're going to have a switch point. But what we got to do is we got to trick everything to where it's happy dappy. So in its rested position, we're going to be in contact with the 7300. But we've got to control both radios to do two separate stages of operation to be able to get this to work to where when we go and we put the thing into transmit mode, click. Now this coax is attached to this radio. But this radio now gets turned on and goes into transmit mode. And because it's not Mars modified, it won't allow it to transmit in 11 meters. Think about it. But it still goes into transmit, but there's no RF coming out of the radio. So therefore, now this radio is deaf. It can't hear anything. So no matter what you run by this... So remember, there's going to be open leads inside this cabinet. There's going to be weep signal that's going to transfer over here. No matter what you run by this, you're not going to blow the receive out of your radio. How do I know this works? Because I've been running it for two and a half years like this. And I've used it on all kinds of different kinds of radios. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct this box and how we go about controlling it. So we have to have two stages. ANT, radio, let's say 955, and 7300. Now, if you have a radio that you want to use in the HF mode, okay, but <coughs> let's look at it from the reverse side of the, the, the freeway now, okay. RF is going to come in, and then you're going to have your switch that switches between these two poles. Okay. What happens if we take a double pull, double throw relay? Okay. And so when this switches, and this now connects to here, we take this and loop it back through this connection. So the 7300 or whatever high-end transmitter you want that you can't run all the way to ground. So if you wanted to use it in its actual legal operation, so you wanted to go use it on 20, 40, you know, 80, 160, whatever, it doesn't matter to me, and you wanted to use your old piece of iron or your old transmitter or whatever you wanted, what are we doing with this RF that's coming out of this radio now? Through the same relay, because you tie these two posts together, this is now going to get disconnected over and it takes and it dumps this out to a fourth coax jacket 
Okay, that goes to a dummy. Load. The RF can exist in the same path. Inside the same cabinet, it's not going to affect each other in any way as long as each one of these tuned pathways is isolated. So now, my first dummy load that I used, and it's here, it's buried. I used this little guy. Okay. It's a coax line terminator by, made by Bird. That's like, I think, a 50 or 100 watt version. What is this thing? Um, 50 watts, 50 ohms. This radio now takes sole control of the antenna. This RF gets dumped off into a dummy load. So this, they both go into transmit, but now this one's technically muted. You're not going to overload the receiver. That's really key. Now, there's a bunch of little moving parts that are going to be involved here. There's, I think, six relays is what we're going to use. And we have to fire everything in a certain sequence to make this work successfully. Okay, We can't use the 955 as a trigger. We have to use an external trigger of some kind. Because we want everything to turn on and turn off in a certain sequence at a certain time. If you don't do this, for a hot second, that 7300 is going to have a full 100 watts of power dumped into its receiver and you're going to kill it. So keep that in mind. Now I've explained this far enough that there's going to be about 900 people out there that are going to be like, okay, see enough, click, they're going to stop watching because they've already figured out what I'm going to go on in great detail and explain later on today. So now, inside the same enclosure, we're going to have our trigger. Now, depending, I have mine set up a little bit differently than this, but it's going to work the same, the same principles are going to apply. Um, you're going to have your trigger, which is going to start the cascade of events. Okay. So it's going to come in, it's going to hit the coil on a relay. So we've got our little relay, the coil and the coil, and we're going to switch this on ground. Okay. So this is going to be ground. Sorry, I can drop a full schematic. If you, any of you guys don't get it by the end of this video, I'm going to be like, I don't know how to help you. Okay. We're going to use double pull, double throw, 12 volt relays for this entire thing. My preferential device of destruction is the 5 amp double pull, double, th uh, double pull, single throw relay. That guy right there. I use this in everything. They're reliable. They put up with a ton of punishment. And you can pass more than 100 watts through this relay, and they're perf perfectly tunable. Um, I had a bunch of clear ones, which I don't think I have any of those left. I um, I found them on Amazon or something. They were clear. And the little tiny reeds that are in here are really impressive. But we're going to have a hot 12-volt source come into this side of the box. 12-volt P. And then 12-volt uh, ground. A little negative current going on there. So that, we're going to float the ground for the entire cabinet. Now, what these relays, we're going to have two relays in this side of the cabinet and three relays on this side of the cabinet. Three, yeah. <laughs> we're going to walk through it step by step. Pardon me, three relays on this side of the cabinet, two relays on this side of the cabinet. If you guys got it, you'll understand what I'm saying. So the idea is that we're going to have an external trigger of some kind, either it be a foot pedal or one of the Heil trigger, you know, pistol trigger grips, and it's going to close this relay. Now what do we choose to do with this relay is really important. This section of what takes place is almost secondary at this point. you got to remember that most of the ICOMs and the Kenwoods and all the new radios, there's about a 10 to 20 millisecond delay from going into transmit mode. So as soon as you fire down the, the key, you might think it's instant, but it's really not. There's a little bit of latency that's in there. Everything's shutting down, the radio's going into mute, it's killing, the, it's killing off the VFO inside the radio, and then it's bringing on in its own time sequence the transmitter side. We're going to capitalize on that delay. <laughs> That's the only way that this works safely. 
is that we capitalize on the delay and we're going to minimize the amount of time that that's present. Now, in reverse, as everything's shutting off, click, 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 and the sequence of orders of everything is shutting off, there you're going to capitalize on that delay once again of the radio's got a built-in latency to it to where it is assuming that it's in transmit mode, so therefore it's going to keep the receiver muted as the transmitter inside the, the radio shuts down. I explain this to people over the phone and they go cross-eyed, they get buggy, and they're like, Bleh. but it works. This system works. It's really super simple. It's just a couple relays, a little 12-volt source, and a couple coax connectors. I'm not going to build this third leg into his particular DAO module for his, his radio because he's going to only use this on 11 meters. If he wants to in the future and go out and get his ham ticket, which I strongly su suggest he does, because ham radio is, is fun, for the most part, <laughs> um, then he can go and capitalize on all the other options for his radio. He just wants to use it as a high-end receiver, and with SDRs, um, well, we have scoured the market, and there's very few SDRs out there that have you that have a mute. And what I mean by a mute is not an audible mute. There's quite a few of them that have a mute for in the audio side. We're talking in the VFO to kill the VFO and allows us to do that with an external trigger. If somebody would build a freaking SDR that allows us to do that, so we have a like a physical wire that we can tie onto with the SDR, they would sell hundreds of thousands of them. Because all these guys could go out and use all their old equipment, but still be able to enjoy the software receiver, the big pan adapter, the waterfall, the ability to go digital. <sighs> Yay, hasn't happened yet. So now we've got to go back and do this kind of quasi-moto engineering. Okay, so. Hold on a second, I gotta get a drink of water. Hold on a second. Okay, so we're gonna utilize the relay switch speed. And we're going to capitalize on the fact that there's going to be a time delay with the relays moving to make this system work safely. The other thing that we have to take into account is ground potential differential in the audio chain. We don't want to create a ground loop. I don't want my friend to have to sit there and listen to an AM broadcast station or a hum or a hiss or anything because the grounds are all tied together <laughs> inside the unit. Now, all the relay coils are going to be tied together, and we're going to use, we're going to capitalize everything on ground. We're going to switch everything on ground. Okay, so we're going to have one committed hot lead. It's going to hit every single relay, but every single thing that we switch to make the relays work, we're going to utilize ground as a switch potential. Okay, so on these particular relays, in the naturally relaxed position, okay, Without the coil energized, the voltage signal, your signal is going to travel from here to here, from this post to this post. When the coil is charged, it's going to travel from here to here. In this first relay, we're going to short the center post together, and we're going to bring them back and tie them to ground. Okay, so the case of this Dow key is going to be ground. We're going to pick that current up, we're going to pick that voltage up, and we're going to use the case potential ground, which is going to be omnipresent, and universal and we're going to use that to drive everything and we're going to flip everything on and off okay so this first relay is going to drive our relays on this side of the universe and this side of the universe we're literally going to put a wall down the middle of this this enclosure this metal closure that i've got we're going to have the rf on one side we're going to have the radios and all the controls for the radios on the other so we're doing like a dual dow key system not just RF, but we're also doing the radios and how we're going to flop them into transmit. When we go into transmit, we're going to take one of the legs off this relay, this lead, and we're going to run it over and we're going to use it to start the sequence of events on this side of the cabinet. This leg here is going to hop out and fire another relay. Let me grab a couple more relays here. This is so simple once you get it visualized in your head. The gang of three. The gang of one. Well, the gang of two over here. Because we have to replicate the second stage. Remember, 
these relays have to move before these relays move. So that means we're going to use our initialized point. We're going to use this relay to trip this relay, which will in turn trip this relay. This relay will trip also this relay, relay and then this relay. You see why I said there had to be three over here and two over there? Okay. The amount of time that it takes the relays to fire is roughly about, guessed it, 10 milliseconds. So by us using that, we can make one radio deaf, dumb, and blind <laughs> and bring the other one into full circle. This side of the relay will trip this relay. It'll in turn pull a signal and it'll close two contacts, which will take the 7300 into transmit. That same cycle has to repeat itself over here. Then, because we're going to trip the 7300 first, then in turn, this relay is going to charge this relay with the ground from here to ground, and then from here to this relay. We'll in turn trip this relay, which will cause the 955 to go into transmit. So it's just like closing the mics. And that's exactly how we're going to control the radios. So Steve's going to have two pieces of wire coming out of this side of the cabinet. He's going to have a plug going in, two pieces of wire coming out that he's got to tie into his mic plugs on the front of the radio. And what he does with his audio lines from there, that's his business, but they're both independent of each other. So the 7300 is going to have a mic jack plugged into it with two wires attached to it where it's going to take the shield at the 7300 and it's going to kick it over to the transmit, which is switch ground, and that's going to put the 7300 into transmit. And the same thing with the 955, he's got a little pigtail with an RCA jack hanging out the front of it so he can plug his audio into it any way he wants to because he's working on doing some Quasimodo line level, or I think D-Rail might have hooked him up with line level direct injection. I'm not too sure that's not my problem. <clears throat> We're going to capitalize on the time delay. So you're going to have our primary relay that's going to switch all this other mess. The last thing that we want to have set off in both chains is going to be the transmit. And then taking our relay to control from the 955, allowing that to switch to the antenna. Got it? It's really simple. No, it really is. It's five relays, and we're doing this all in a sequence of events. Now, in theory, if you have the most ideal, perfect grounding system going on in your station, we don't have to worry about differential grounding current um, for each one of your audio leads. Like the 955, that's a four-pin jack, so therefore it's going to have a common ground on the mic for transmit and audio. Those two are going to be together, but the ICOM is not the same way. The ICOM has its own audio ground, which guys commonly tie together with the ground potential at the ICOM, which is really not a smart way to do it. <clears throat> you see there's going to be, there, there could be a possible of differentiation in, in ground potential between the two circuits, and you're going to get a loop. That's the reason we need to have this second, or this, yeah, the second relay. For the most part because you could use just a trigger to fire this relay and then fire that relay but you have to have that time gap to allow the receiver to go into full mute and actually charge itself and take itself into transmit mode now all of this happens that fast so the relays are going to all go clack to our perception clack but there's really not there's a delay that's involved so now that you guys got the very basic mechanics of how this works Everybody got that? Okay, let's build it. Okay, so before we run too far down the rabbit hole of getting this thing built, we went ahead and we, uh, we mocked up our little project box. So this is where the antenna and then the outputs for each one of the radios, the triggers for each one of the radios is gonna go. This is gonna be your inputs for your radio. So, I haven't figured out what I want to do yet, which I want to have what. But we'll have like the ICOM and then his actual transmit radio plug in here on the front side. On off switch, this is going to be his power wire port and then of course his trigger source. The one that's going to start the whole chain reaction of things. So, three relays to drive the show. And then of course we've built this uh, copper shield in there. So when we put the lid on this thing, it's going to be an RF isolated circuit. So I don't have to worry about weep RF getting into any of the relay 
functions over here, we're getting into the output port jacks for the radios. Make sense? RF isolation. Kill two birds with one stone. So we're going to use a 316 mini coax, which will more than adequately carry that couple hundred watts worth of power that we're going to run through this thing. Two at the most, maybe probably a hundred is what he's going to run through this box. Some little tiny 22 gauge Teflon wire, because we're not going to need anything more than that. And then some 75 ohm shielded twist braid wire for the inputs on the mic jacks. Of course, a little bit of a power wire and then some ferrite to block stuff that's going from A to B, B to C, D, D. Everything that goes out of this box, you want to have ferrite on it for isolation issues. And of course, then you want to have an induction choke that goes from here to here to keep the RF on that side of the that side of the, the box. So, okay, um, I'm gonna start wiring this. I'll probably check in two, three times as we go along. But this is our base blueprint. Uh, we're gonna add another screw and a ground lug here, and that's gonna be where we tie all our capacitors for tuning to this deal. So, okay. On that note, I shall return. Okay, so step one, we got the positive rail wired in. So what this does is when we flip the switch, it's gonna take and put 12 volt positive to each one of the relays, okay? Now, we gotta make sure to put little snubbers on these because these particular relays don't have snub diodes built into them. Some do, some don't, these particular don't. So if you go to try and buy these off the shelf, make sure to get the ones with the snubbers in them. I personally like to have the part external um, if you don't add a little snub diodes when you unkey or key up, there's going to be a pop in your receive. And the same thing, well, it's going to be really present in the receive of the radio when you unkey. It's going to pop. You're going to see a little pop, a little spike of signal in the receiver. Now, we, I just want to remind everybody that we have to go to this level. I mean, this is like way overkill for a Dow key. But we have to go to this level to be able to protect the receiver in our 7300, 7610, the new more modern radios, okay? The whole goal is so that when we key up, we have a very nice smooth transition from, you know, our $12, $1,500 receiver slash transmitter transceiver radio over to our five six hundred dollar CB or whatever other piece of transmitter equipment that we can do all our line level and funky audio with and protect our, uh, our ICOM in this particular case. So now we're going to wire up the ground and it's going to all start from this relay. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come from the center pin. This is stereo jack, but the key is actually a mono plug. That's okay. We're going to abandon all the other plugs and there's no voltage here. There's no positive voltage or anything. So there's no chance for a, a voltage loop. We're just going to use the tip ring terminal, this one right here. And what we're going to do is the tip ring is going to short to the case, which is ground, and it's going to in turn fire this first relay. This side of the relay is going to drive these relays. This side of the relay is going to drive the RF relays. But we're going to only use one wire. So I'll show you as we go. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get this set up and then I'll go ahead and I'll set up this one. So we're going to wire in the keyer which can be, you can, you can use a keyer from a radio or another mic or a trigger gun like what we're going to use. But we have to separate the two and we want this relay to drive everything. We don't want to have an electrical connection back to the case um, from the trigger because that can turn into an antenna which can pick up noise. And because this is going to be running right next to our audio circuit, can cause us to have a feedback loop, which we don't want to have. We want this box to be able to sit RF lifted above ground as much as possible. Keep that in mind. That's the reason we got to go to this, this level of detail. So when we do our trigger, the only thing that the trigger is going to do is flip this relay. Then the relay, because it's isolated, the coil is going to move the, mo the, mo the motor, the actual coil is going to move the motion. We're going to use this relay with ground to trip these other relays. So we're going to take a wire and come off ground, which is going to be common ground for the cabinet, to this relay. 
but then everything from here is going to be isolated. So all we're going to do is be shorting these other terminals together, but we want to do it in a sequence, which is really important. So let me go ahead and we're going to get a ground wire hooked up over to our first relay and then we're going to bring the leads off of this to our second relay and then we'll bring our leads off of this to our first relay here. Okay, hope everybody got that. Away we go. Okay, so the radio switch side is all wired up. The RF switch side is not done. We haven't done anything with it. Now what we did is we added ourselves a ground distribution bus on this side. This little piece of phenolic with some double side stick tape. We put a 6 amp diode in here for protection just in case somebody goes and hooks it up backwards. We don't have to worry about killing any of this other stuff in here. Okay. The 6 amp diode is really important. These capacitors to ground are really important and the fact that we're not operating on case ground is really important. Now there's going to be people out there that are going to watch this and they're going to build this with a case ground instead of going to this level of complexity and ground everything. Hey great. Look, what I have found by uh, isolating this from ground is that I alleviate a possible ground loop. Okay, so the relays all act independent. So the unexposed or unshielded exposed wire that goes to your power supply, you don't have to worry about any RF, ambient RF, or noise from the 110 outlet or the 110 wire that this might be running by getting into your receive because your receive is isolated from your transmit signal and we're trying to keep the signals as separated as much as possible. I built my first one with a common ground and ended up having a ground loop issue between the power supply and the isolated radio receive. I ended up here in cool oldies is what I ended up hearing. Try it. I'm just saying this is the way I'm choosing to build this one. That way I know when I ship this thing a thousand miles from here, the guy when he goes and he hooks it up, I'm not going to get this phone call. Man, I'm listening to Cruising with the Oldies over here because he picked up some AM broadcast station. Or, man, when I hook up to that box, I get a bunch of hiss and noise. I want to avoid that. So the other things that we've done to help avoid that problem are these things. Now, I keep talking about this, this trigger system. I've been using a foot pedal for a lot of different things for a lot of years. I thought I'd give this a test drive. This is the Heil external key gun. Okay. The ground at the cabinet down here is the ground on this jack. Now that wire runs out and this is a big antenna. So the signal that comes back in that we're now going to introduce to our relay, pardon me, the signal that comes back in now that we're going to introduce to our relay, we've got a ferrite bead um, type 61 with about five or six turns on it, right here, and then we got a couple 103 disc capacitors. Now, everybody's going to say, well, the ferrite bead's enough. Well, in some cases it is, but if I end up having AC noise, I want to give that a different path to ground as quickly as I can couple it to ground and help suppress that noise. Okay? This, the ferrite bead, all that does is change the resonant frequency of the wire. So, by increasing the resonant frequency of the wire to an infinite tune, plus the advent of the bypass caps to ground, we know for a fact that this line, which has now come into the system, externally is going to be clean and signal free and it allows us to keep our remote also isolated that and the other thing that these little tiny disc capacitors are going to help if there's some kind of weird freaking funky weird electrical spike i don't have to worry about my guy getting shocked too overly bad this will help dissipate that just a little bit that's the theory <laughs> even though the plug on this thing is grounded okay it's all in an attempt to make sure that when I ship this thing to the other side of the country, it's not going to come back and the guy's not going to be disappointed. That's the level I'm going to, and that's the reason I'm going to this level. Okay, so our ground distribution bus, we have our 12-volt ground, which goes to this relay. And remember what I said, this relay is going to drive this side of the cabinet and this side of the cabinet. 
okay now, i haven't determined which relay i want to have do what yet but i have a pretty good feeling that the ground wire on this side because we've tied these two poles of the relay together this side's going to go to this relay and then in turn it's going to fire this relay so all that determines is which one of these connectors gets to see the antenna first or last we'll come back over here in a second so this relay closes takes a 12 volt source runs it around in a loop comes back over here and trips this relay this relay in turn has its own 12 volt source once again we don't want to create a loop that gets tripped and closed to here which in turn fires this relay now the work is done here the physical work is done so pull the trigger click this relay closes about 10 milliseconds later this rail relay will close this one will fire the icom this one will in turn fire the 955 cobra 25 or whatever other transmitter he wants to use so now we've built a latency of amount of time to allow the receiver to fully terminate in the VFO inside the ICOM, letting it spool down, putting the ICOM into transmit, and then we can bring the 955 on, which will help isolate the receive. Now, listen, the receive on the ICOM has got a bunch of protection to it, and the chances are pretty slim that we're not going to be able to overload. Um, the automatic gain control circuit in the ICOM. But the goal is to make it so that it's completely seamless. So when the radio goes from, we're over here receiving, click to transmit, when we come out of transmit, there's no exterior RF other than the receive, so the AGC doesn't have to play a catch up and try to overcome. Otherwise your radio is gonna be slightly deaf when you come off transmit, and then you have to wait for the receive to come back up. Meanwhile, your guy is talking to you. My guy likes sideband. So, needless to say, you follow where I'm going with this now? When he's on sideband, you gotta have receive almost immediately. You can't wait for it to slowly creep its back, the receive to come back with the AGC automatically adjusting itself. So, okay, now that we've got the ground side done, all I got to do is tie in my external 75 ohm wires and you want to use 75 ohm. You could use twin lead wire, but remember that twin lead wire is now an antenna that you're introducing a foreign signal into here with 75 ohms. It's going to be naturally inherent out of resonance with all the other circuits that you're going to have. And it's a common standard when you're working with audio circuits in certain formats. So that's the reason that we're using 75 ohm shielded coax that and it's rub resistant for the most part and pretty and it's color coded i've got right and left so red and white and we'll have it appropriately labeled here and so he'll be able to know when he goes to strip this back okay i've got red so that means i need to hook this to my icom or whatever just trying to overthink the problem a little bit more than what's absolutely necessary but hey there you go okay so moving forward already on this way too lee overthought process let's go wire the the actual dow key these two relays up and in theory really for a dow key all you need is one relay um, it's because we're tying all this expensive radio equipment over here on this side into the circuit we really can get away with just switching the antenna over here um, but if you wanted to just have this basic of a switch you could literally go buy this box with a way substandard relay in it from MFJ and it'd be all plastic and leak RF and leak signal and metal. It's a reason we use metal. Anyhow, um, let me start tying up my 316 and we're gonna go ahead and start running our wires over here. We're gonna bring this wire in over to here and then use this side to switch this relay. So we'll have a second wire. There'll be two wires, one coming from here to here and then another one coming from the ground lead here, isolated over to drive this relay. Got it? Okay, bye. Okay, so all the electrical is done. We've got our ground lead that comes from, our 12 volt lead that comes from here off this side of the relay. It comes around to here and it fires this relay. This wire here, right here, comes off of our ground distribution bus, goes through this choke. Both wires go through this choke comes around and it hits this point on the relay. This relay, when it closes, will turn and in turn fire 
this relay. Now remember, the goal is to have the ICOM or whatever your receiver be that you're going to trip into transmit first, okay, move the closest proximity to relay. These leads are long for a reason, but the ground leads that come from here and here are roughly the same length. So that means the timing of this relay and this relay, this relay and this relay, are going to be approximately the same. That's very important. Okay, so now all the electricals are complete. Now it's time for us to start talking about the pathway that we have to take for our RF. So we're going to have one source, our coax. It's going to come down and it's going to attach to here. Okay, now remember we want everything to be in a relaxed state until we go into transmit because we don't want to have to have a relay in the coil constantly on. Relay is temporary, solenoid is permanent, so they're not permanent, but the coils are wound differently. This thing, these are all temporary, uh, intermittent, momentary use relays. So we have to utilize the fact that when the relay is in its relaxed position, that we are going to have a clear pathway from this coax connector to this coax connector. When we go into transmit, we want to have this coax connector attached to this coax connector. So, <clears throat> we can split these two relays, which I'm considering doing, but what we got to do is over here, let's talk about it from the ICOM's point of view and its pathway over to the antenna. RF is going to come, or the receive RF is going to pass through this relay, out this post to this pin, then in the relaxed position, to this coax connector, okay? So when we go into transmit, this connection that goes to the radio is going to get shunted from here down through a 50 ohm load to ground. Now that's 10 watts worth of dissipation at a 50 ohm resistance, so it's technically balanced. You don't really need this in there, but I'm putting this in there as a secondary safety, just in case for some reason the ICOM at some point gets spun to where it's like let's say on 10 meters and he has the power level all the way at zero on the radio it's still going to put out like a half a watt instead of that going into an infinite SWR we're going to short this back and bring it to ground so now he's going to have a balanced load when he goes into transmit so it won't fry his finals in his radio just in case okay not necessarily necessary but it could be so I'm planning for the worst praying for the best so now, when we go into transmit, we go click here. This lead now gets isolated. This lead here. This is going to be our return lead over to this relay. So if we think about it from the RF's point of view, from the antenna, the antenna now is no longer going to be serviceable to this relay connection, but this is the, going to be the relay that we're going to fire last but it is the one that is going to attach to the 955. But this is the one that we want to have the RF or your access to the antenna see first. Okay. So I'm not too sure quite how I want to do this, but I've got to replicate this same process over here. So if I bring relax position RF come in, so we're going to use this as our switch point. Okay, so if we attach to here, and so when it is in a relaxed position, this pin goes to here, this pin goes to here, so the RF, the antenna is going to go to here. So then we're going to take this lead and go to here, and across here, and then attach this one to here. Let me think about that for a second. So. ICOM, receive, RF, RF from source to here, this wire goes to here, this wire, when we go into transmit, this will be our source, we'll switch to here to this lead, this lead will in turn switch to this lead, that lead will in turn switch to this lead, okay, so then this one needs to go back to ground, so when this radio comes out of transmit, this lead here goes back to ground. Perfect.
Everybody got that? <laughs> oh, this coax lead is going to attach here. This wire is going to attach here. This lead is going to, or no, this coax goes to here. This lead attaches to here. That lead crosses and it goes back over and comes back to ground. I'm going to draw this out for you. Give me just a second. Okay. This is our actual wiring diagram for the RF pathway. We're going to talk about it from the coax point of view. So it's all about controlling access to the coax, this connector. So the signal is going to come in, be able to loop back through this connection of relay, then go back over to this connection of relay. So otherwise the RF is going to come in here, go out here from the antenna point of view. So your receive signal is going to come in here, go out this pin. We're going to tie it to this pin here this pin here. Then we're going to attach this to the ICOM connection, which is here, here, okay? Then our 50 ohm load. The reason we have this 50 ohm load is to catch any excess signal just in case the radio ever gets put into transmit, whatever, it gives the RF a place to go other than burning up the contacts in the relay. Okay, so this is where your mind gets to melt a little bit. When the relay fires, it closes to this position. Now we're going to take the uh, signal and we're going to create a pathway across these two contact leads and it's going to go back and loop up and come back to the 955 and catch the signal from his transmitter okay and that'll come back to this pin when the relay is in a relaxed position or otherwise we come out of transmit we need to take this pin off the relay and come back down and go to another 50 ohm load to ground that way we can catch any of the spurious RF and immediately shunt it to ground and do something with it and dissipate the energy thus protecting the transmit section of this radio, just in case there might be a problem. Everybody got that? This is your actual wiring diagram. Okay, let me set this up here, put this in frame. Now I got a picture of this. What I'm going to do is I'll put it at the end of the video, so if anybody needs to pause and reference this, they can. All right, this is the way this is going to be wired. I know it's a little bit confusing to listen to me talk about it, so let's go ahead and just do it. Now, as soon as we get this done, we're going to have to hook this up to a dummy load because there's induction that's going to take place. Either it be through the relays and we have to add capacitance to ground to help tune the pathway through the Dow key. Otherwise, we're going to have a severe impedance bump, which is going to do what? Limit our receive. And also, we want to make sure that the RF that's coming from the transmitter to the coax connector is balanced so there's not an SWR bump. Otherwise it could screw up somebody's input tune or it's going to make the front end of the radio, the little SWR bridge is going to jump up. We need to address all of those things. A little complicated, not that bad. Okay, away we go. So now we're seeing the resistor. And now on the other side, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so had changed a couple things. I had these two wires backwards. So my 12 volt source here, and I had the working movement here, backwards. So those two wires flopped, and then I had to bring the remote jack up to the ground terminal. I didn't show that. Other than that, this thing worked just as designed. I went ahead and hooked up the 12-volt source, brought it down, brought it to a strain relief that I've glued to the floor with a piece of ferrite bead to isolate it from the outside world, tied the ground across, used a ferrite bead to tie it to the outside world, and now over here... The way this works is the coax comes here, goes across, goes around. So this goes across, comes around, and goes up here, just like in our design. 
Guys, remember this? It's wired exactly the same. So I went ahead and I did some labeling. The Milfer of all Dow keys. It's two amp. So it's got a one amp fuse in it right now. So this shank should never pull anything more than about maybe an amp. And we labeled the back side of this as well. So now what we got to do is tune it for all the impedance bumps that we have going on. So let me get set up for that and I'll show you how we're going to go about doing that. Okay, this is where it gets a little kind of complicated in the brain. At least for me. It's not. This is like second nature. You guys have all seen me do this with... Um, coax connectors and amps where we're talking about doing a pass-through tune a passive tune right so where we're going to attach our capacitors is where shit's going to switch out and switch in so it doesn't do us any good to do any kind of tuning on this port the connection that goes to the antenna so what we're desiring to do is have the signal that goes from the meter pass through all these induction bumps all these all these bumps and make it back out to the dumbing load with the lowest amount of resistance. So what we've got going on here is our grid dip meter, our fancy ass KC901 grid dip meter. And what we're going to be looking at is our frequency. So over here is 31 megahertz. Over here is going to be like about 25 megahertz. And we're at 27 megahertz right now. This guy's going to be using this thing on a citizen's band. Even if we went and we changed it to a wide span, okay, this, this is our SWR, 1.608, 1.798. That's what this thing is naturally resistant at. So we have a natural standing SWR. Now remember, with induction and capacitance, you can tune up a fence post. With enough induction and enough capacitance, you can make RF move any way you want it to. Once you get your brain wrapped around that, and that principle, you can tune almost anything. So what we have here is an air variable that is, I believe, 15 to 100 puff. Okay? And we have it tied into this connection right here on a relay, which is tied to this coax connector, which will be the primary receive relay. So right now what we're doing is we're tuning the radio's ability to hear. Literally. If we don't tune this down to where it's at a 1.0 or a 1.01 or 1.03 or 1.05, then the coax, the capacitance in the coax becomes very active. So if he's not using a 3-foot jumper, and let's say he's using like a 5-foot jumper, he's going to have a huge SWR impedance bump is the RF tries to come through and it's going to limit his ability to hear. We'll see the reverse when this thing transmits, goes into transmit mode. We're going to see that impedance bump and it's going to represent itself as a high input SWR to this device. We don't want that. So right now, after we've attached our 25 or so puff cap, look at that. Now our SWR curve has dropped. Now let me come over here. I'm going to start turning the tuner. Watch what happens. Very, very slowly. 1.045. Now, we can tune that even a little bit flatter, but that is perfectly non reactive. Now, let's go ahead and we're going to change our span. We'll set it out. Oh, bumped it with my hand, got too fast. We'll set it out to 50 megahertz wide. So, right now, we'll keep our center at 27. See a little cursor moving? See how it jumped from over here to over there? We are 27 megahertz wide to 0 megahertz. So, we get past 40. So now we're down into the legal hand bands, almost into the legal hand bands. So now we're into 10 meters. His SWR is now 1.0. And we'll stay below that all the way across until we get out to the infinite noise for what we're talking about. It jumps up to a 1.2. 
that is beautiful. So now how we address this is we go ahead and we mute. We mute this thing, tell it to stop pulsing RF down through the signal. And you can do this with a grid dip meter, by the way. You don't have to have like an MFJ, 259B, whatever. Now that that's off, I can go here and I can remove this wire, measure the capacitance from here to ground, make a little bit of adjustment and calculate an adjustment, because remember, there's this induction here. Then I can add a capacitor from here back to ground after measuring this value, which I bet is going to be somewhere in the area of about 50. And then we can reevaluate, and I bet you it'd be pretty darn close. So, give me a minute. And pull that wire, we'll do the measurement, and I'll show you what we got. Okay, so got our little capacitance meter hooked up, and we're measuring what we got going on. Now, I know that the length of wire, and I know this length of wire, adds X amount of puff of capacitance. Don't try to copy this. Buy the freak. This is the cheapest meter money can buy. Trust me, I've got very expensive ones. I just don't ever use them because this thing works great. Um, buy this little meter. It's like $15, and you can do the same thing, and you can measure your own capacitance. But now I know for a fact that I'm going to end up being somewhere between about 50 and 60 puff. I'm serious. You put my hand by the wire, it changes the capacitance. You see that? It's sensitive enough for what we do. It's clean enough for the girls I run with, anyhow. So, let me go grab a little 50 puff capacitor. We're going to throw it in there. We might end up having to add another 10 puff capacitor to it and get it up to 60 puff. But let's put the 50 on there and watch what happens, okay? So let me put that 50 puff capacitor capacitor in there and we'll be back. And when you get down to that level of tuning, it just gets too sensitive. So, this ended up being a 47 puff capacitor. Because 50 was a 1.12. And 40 was a 1.09. So 47... We were able to get ourselves on down there to 1.058, which is beautiful. Now, it's no point in really trying to tune it any further than that, because we're going to have coax length and losses and velocities in the coax we're going to have to take into account. So, as soon as I hit the trigger, though, see that? So what has happened... Is when I fire the trigger, bloop, now the signal, remember, is getting shunted right back down here to this 50 ohm load. So, let's fire the trigger and you'll see the SWR is going to pop up just a hair. Watch. 1.1. That's what we're looking for. So you have that little momentary lag in there. It's about 10 milliseconds worth as the relay is opening and closing. Approximately the same amount of time it takes for the radio to energize and de-energize. So, we're set as far as passing through on the receiver. So now we've got to go work on input for the 955. So let me set up for that. Okay, so we got our tuner attached. And this is our terminus point at the relay. This is going to be the 955. So now this is what it looks like without a capacitor. So as soon as I hit the scan button here, so it's showing us we got a 1.5 SWR naturally through it, running into the resistor. Remember, right now, until we hit that trigger set, we are looking at that 50 ohm load. So now we've added the 20 or so puff of the capacitor. Now let's fire the relay. This is where we need to tune it for. Not in a relaxed position, but for when we're in transmit. So let's start adding capacitance. Look at that dip. 0 0.01. Oh, it's touchy. But because we've added capacitance, 1.01. Because we've added capacitance here, which is attached to this coax, once I release the trigger, we're going to see it also affects the dummy load. See that? It's all about knowing. It's 
where to add subtract capacitance when you're working with induction circuits. Okay, so now we're going to hit span once again. Span. We're going to go to 100 megahertz or 50 megahertz wide. And once again, look at that. So it changes the curve. So if we wanted to, by subtracting capacitance here, watch how the frequency dip changes all the way across the span. That's from zero to like 56 megahertz. So that's what we're tuning for, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1
to try and keep the RF as separated as possible, really, um, with my own experimentation and what I've got going on with my my own station, I found that this is the system that works. If you listen real close, you know, hear that it's click, 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 click. And then when you unkey it, it's click, 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 click. That little tiny delay is the difference between having your receiver go bang, bang. So when you key up, your receiver will catch a little bit of the RF from the radio, and it'll catch a little bit when it comes out of transmit, so the AGC is going to be, I'm telling you, that little bit of lag that's built into it because of the relay movements helps tremendously on protecting your receiver. Um, we could probably add a capacitor on this relay here to slow down the transmit receive switch that's taking place and you do it on the 955 side so it helped buffer the latency on the time for the ICOM side. But Mr. Steve here you go brother the mother of all Dow keys and it would be a radio switch as well because the Dow key all that does is shift the antenna where this is a trigger control and an actual control for the radios and that sequence is what makes it so crucial. So, guys, on that note, I'm out of here. Um, let's see what time is it. It's 1.14 in the morning. This video will probably come out about 3. 3 a.m. Mr. Steve, I hope you put this to good use. And I really, truly hope you appreciate the amount of energy that went into this. I told you on the phone, oh, it's no big deal. It's really, it's not. This isn't a big deal. It took me probably twice as long because I had to slow down, video it, explain it set up each shot it's no big deal pretty simple I do ask this of y'all those of you that watch this that might find inspiration from this or find the knowledge that's in this video useful or if you decide to copy it and mass produce these that's great if you do etch my name in the board someplace put it in a trace on the board you know, just put BBI in a trace someplace Send me a picture. I'll think it's cool. I'll hang it on a wall someplace. You know, like if one of the guys from FFJ decide they're going to get inspired and actually build one more product that we can actually use. <clears throat> Other than please, hey, send your engineers up here so I can teach them guys how to solder a little bit better. Other than that, just take a minute. And I mean that tongue-in-cheek, by the way, MFJ. Just put my name in a trace. Or... Write it on a box, or when you go and you copy this thing, tell everybody, hey man, I got the idea from a BBI box, and then I made it better, and I made it my own. That's what this game's all about. Sharing the knowledge and helping teach each other. So, don't ask me to build another one, you guys. This is something you all can build at home on your own. I swear to God. Gentlemen, my name is BBI. Without a shadow of a doubt, I am the biggest mud duck in Idaho. Check us out. Please come check us out. www.wbims.com. Come follow me on Facebook and, of course, on Instagram. I don't do a lot with Twitter. I don't do a lot of, with Snapchat at all. Man, just come check us out and follow along. And if you like what you've seen, click subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. It makes both of us feel better. I swear to God it does. I got to go. Middle of the night. Sunday evening. It's time to go to bed. The Milfer of Dow Keys. I'll see you. Bye.